Hi there, Tigra Cat. What are you doing, big guy? Oh, you're a good kitty. Yeah. I think you might want to go indoors. Well, hello there, everyone. You've tuned in UXW Bill. I thought the rain would never stop, but it seems we've been granted a temporary reprieve. Emphasis most definitely on the temporary, because I just heard a big old peal of thunder in the background. So with today's video, we're going to talk about diagnosing, well, not really diagnosing per se, but certainly troubleshooting, Ford's EATC, or Electronic Automatic Temperature Control System. Now, there are a couple things I'd like to get out of the way, first and foremost, with this video. First, before you comment, please watch the video in its entirety so that you have all the information. Second of all, yes, there is a known problem with these modules wherein the O-rings fail, resulting in incorrect operation or switching into the fail-safe mode of operation, where you have air coming out of the defroster vents and the heater. I actually repaired this module with the key keeper's assistance. We did the one in his car as well. In fact, you can see I even signed my work. And we thought that would be the end of the story. For his car it was, but for my late grandfather's Mercury Grand Marquis, unfortunately it is not. The system is still stuck in fail-safe mode, and I'm just going to try a few exploratory theories here to see if I can maybe bring about some sort of a change in its operation or figure out why the module's not working. But first let's go ahead and have a look and see how the system is actually designed to operate. Alright, so I have returned and since demonstrating everything that I want to show you would take far more hands than any human I'm aware of happens to have, certainly more than I happen to have, I've gone ahead and put the camcorder on a tripod. Of course, it's sitting on a rather plush leather seat, so it'll probably tilt backwards at the most inopportune moment imaginable. What you're looking at right now is, of course, the dashboard in my late grandfather's Mercury Grand Marquis automobile. This is the same thing that you'll see in any of the other Panther cars, give or take a few differences in trim depending on which one you buy. You know, the Ford Crown Victoria, the Mercury Grand Marquis, or, of course, I believe it's the Lincoln Town Car. I never can keep the Continental and the Town Car straight. It doesn't really matter because what we're here to talk about is the method by which this system operates. This is actually a hybrid system. You have this control module that sits in the dash, and it's the brains of the operation. There's a microcontroller inside there. There's a display and the buttons on the front that allow you to choose the mode of operation, fan speed, temperature, all those sorts of good things. But the way it ultimately controls the system is through a hybridized approach. The blend door, which lets you choose between hot or cold air moving through the climate control plenum, is electrical in nature. It has a little DC permanent magnet motor that drives a gear train that in turn moves the blend door back and forth. And the computer knows where that blend door's position is at any given moment because there's also a track of resistive material inside that assembly. And if that resistive material fails, which it seems to like to do around the 70 or 80,000 mile mark, you have to replace that and the system will usually indicate the fault by producing only hot air. It seems to fail in the full heat on mode, which I suppose again is a matter of failing safe. We've had to replace that on both this car and the key keeper's car and both of them died around the same time. So if, if you have some experience with that, it would be interesting to maybe collect some statistics. The actual airflow doors, however, are vacuum operated. You see this little harness right here with these multicolored lines to, going to it? These are not electrical lines, they are vacuum lines. One of these supplies manifold vacuum from the engine, and the others actuate the various mode doors in the system, which govern where the air is sent. And it's certainly possible that you could have a vacuum leak there, which could prevent the system from working properly. But as I'll demonstrate here in just a moment, I don't believe that we have any trouble with vacuum leaks here. The first thing I'll do is I'll start the car up. It would help to have the keys in it. And we'll just find out which line actually has vacuum pulled on it. And you can use a vacuum gauge to do this. I have one as part of this hand brake bleeder and vacuum pump kit. It's not the best thing in the world, but it suffices. And if you listen very carefully, 
you might be able to hear the telltale hiss of vacuum. I cover it up, it stops. So let's just see if we are in fact getting a good vacuum there. And it would certainly appear that we are. It's not a perfect vacuum at 30 inches worth of mercury, but it doesn't have to be for this application. So we definitely have a working vacuum supply coming to this car. Let's turn the key off. It would probably be best to do this with the battery disconnected. But this is a relatively low hazard occupation here. It's not like you're messing around with the airbags or anything. And these connectors are keyed, so we'll make sure to get them in the right places. And this will energize the climate control module, which will let me do things like turning on the blower fan, stuff like that. Now, when this module first has power restored to it, it commands the blend door to the full hot position, probably as a means by which to initialize it and to determine where exactly it's located. I'll turn the headlights off. They don't need to be on. The display will probably also be blank, but you can bring it to life by pressing outside temp. It's pretty cool outside today. That's one thing the rain has been good for. So we'll turn the system on. The air conditioning, I think, runs all the time in these cars. There's the blower fan coming up because I've turned it down to the lowest extreme of its travel. But the airflow, unfortunately, is coming out of the heater and the defroster vents. It's not working the way that it's supposed to. But here's where we can do a little bit of troubleshooting. I don't know what the function of each one of these is, but I think the white one is maximum AC. That opens the recirculation door. So let's just go ahead and hook our vacuum pump up to that. And if it is what I think it is, you'll hear the sound of the airflow pathway changing. not the world's best handheld vacuum pump, but I think you've heard the change in sound that this thing is now making because I've opened the recirculation door for maximum air conditioning. Let's try another one of these. We'll try the blue one. At one time the key keeper and I had gone through and done this in his car to figure out what they were, but I've slept since then and forgotten. So we'll pull this one down, and that one's the dash vents. Might be able to point one of those at the camera, and you could actually hear it blowing on the microphone. But it seems that these hold pretty steady, so I don't think there's a vacuum leak here. It might leak down in time. Again, this doesn't have to be a perfect vacuum. This isn't something like a hermetic refrigeration system or anything just has to be enough to make the actuators operate. And in the short time I've got to demonstrate it here on the video without boring all of you to death, it definitely seems to be working. So let's see what some of these others do. You'll notice that every time I release the vacuum, the sound changes because the system's failing safe. Alright, that one I think is probably heater. That one's just defroster, actually. So by process of elimination, the black one is our vacuum supply. The yellow one is probably going to be the heater outlet. Yeah, I've got air conditioning coming out of the floor now, which is a great place to have it come out, of course. So our vacuum system seems to be basically functional. You don't seem to have anything leaking down there. Of course, if you did, you'd have to fix it. You're on your own for that one because that would probably involve taking the dashboard out of this car, which is not as bad as it could be. It's a lot worse for a lot of more modern cars. That's one thing I really like about these cars. Ford produced these things for so long that they just really, they really got to the point where in almost every way they had an exemplary design. They're reliable, the parts for them are everywhere, they're cheap and easy to work on, and, and because, because Ford produced these as police cars with the Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor, they, they all inherited some of that tendency to be tough as nails. But if I put this vacuum assembly on the back of the climate controls, 
even though I'm sure it's leaking somewhat right now since I don't have the little speed nuts attached I tell the system to do something and it just ignores me but the one thing I wanted to demonstrate in the continued name of troubleshooting is that the system really believes that it's going through all the motions to change the direction of airflow I'll try and zoom the camcorder in here. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this or not. It would help if I would operate the camcorder correctly. But I'm going to try and get this position just so. And I'm going to pull the module out of the dash again. The vacuum assembly need not be hooked up to it. So we'll take that off there for the time being. All right, you're looking at the top of the module right now. And right underneath here, there are a total of four solenoids that are supposed to direct the flow of vacuum and operate all those mode doors accordingly. And if I push the buttons on the front panel, you hear those small clicks? The system is certainly trying to cycle the solenoids, but for some reason it's just not quite able to get it done. And that's the problem that I need to troubleshoot. Because, as I mentioned previously, the simple fix, replacing the blown O-rings in these, and they were bad, didn't solve the problem. This climate control head still doesn't function the way that it's supposed to. So we're going to have to move up to the next level here and actually take it in for a bit of an exploration. And I've been thinking about how I could test this on the bench, and I think I've actually come up with a good way to do that. So when I return, which I will just in a moment, thanks to the magic of video editing, I will have this I will take this module apart and I will further discuss its theory of operation and point out what some of the items inside it are for. Boy, this workbench is a abysmal mess. I've got to clean this up. All right, I'm back at the workbench, which is probably a good thing because right now it's raining outside, although the sun is trying to break through. It just can't quite decide what it wants to do outside. There's a big old blue storm cloud coming in, and yet the sun's trying to come out while it's raining. I'll tell you what, welcome to Illinois. If you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. But as I started to say, we're down here at the workbench, safely out of the weather, and it's a little bit cooler down here in the basement as well, which is always a bonus. Got the workbench cleaned up. Here's the electronic automatic temperature control head. And in order to continue our troubleshooting, we need to take it apart. Taking it apart is not too terribly difficult, but I will try to tell you of some gotchas that I came across when I did this for the first time. There are two Torx head screws at the rear. They're both T20s. So we'll take those out. And once you've done that, I think that's all that's required. Watch this prove me wrong to get the top half of the climate control module to come apart. And then of course there is a wiring harness with a red connector that plugs into the circuit board. And at that point we're basically done with the circuit board, but before we put it away I'll just hit some of the highlights on here, show you what some of these things are and what they do. You have a cable going over here to the fan control, you have two ribbon cables, rigid type, not the flexible ones, linking the front panel to the main board. And then, of course, as is the automaker's favorite trick, you have a whole slew of house-numbered parts. Pretty much everything that you see on the board here is house-numbered. Let's see if I can zoom in on that so you can have a better look at it. There we go. Maybe turn it over so the light falls on it a little more and you can see it more easily. Right here is the system controller. This is some sort of a microcontroller. Probably nothing terribly powerful, nothing to write home about but it's responsible obviously for scanning the keypad matrix at the front of the unit, driving the display, and also responding to the various and sundry input sources that this thing considers when it determines how it ought to set the temperature, where it should put the mode door, which mode should be active, and of course how fast the fan should be going. In a newer car you'd probably see this being done over the CAN bus as a class 2 serial message. But in this car, I think everything has discrete wiring because, as I say, it's an older design. Even though there is a CAN bus in the, in the late model Ford Panthers, I don't think too many things make use of it, and this is certainly not one of them, at least not entirely. Anyway, 
the system controller considers a couple of inputs. There's a sun load sensor, there's a temperature sensor behind the grill which gives you your outdoor temperature reading. It also tells this thing what it's working against and which mode it might want to select, be it air conditioning or heating, based on the user's specified temperature. There's also an indoor temperature sensor and there might even be a couple of in-duct temperature sensors as well so that it can determine what the temperature inside the air plenum is. I know my mother's Buick Park Avenue has a sensor or two like that in the plenum so the thermostat, the uh, climate control system can determine what the air temperature is if the car has reached the point where the where the heater core has warmed up and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different sensors that play into this but that's the microcontroller and then over here we have a chip which is actually some form of a servo driver and this is probably the chip that takes the commands from the microcontroller and turns them in to the movement of electrons to make these solenoids do their thing because these these will take a considerable amount of current to do their job and most of the time garden variety microcontrollers and similar devices just don't have the kind of capability to deliver high levels of current so they delegate that to a specially designed chip over here and if some of you in the viewing audience are thinking hey I've seen those before you're absolutely right you'll see something very similar to that in almost any CD-ROM drive ever made typically they have many functions integrated into one device and the microcontroller just sends power to that sends commands to that chip and that chip in turn sends power to what the microcontroller wants to have turned on or off. So that's the circuit board. That's not really the part we're interested in. The part we're interested in are these solenoids right here. You can see there are four of them. They all fire into this central vacuum plenum where vacuum is delivered and ultimately redirected. When you go to take this apart, one word of caution, watch out for this rubber bung at the end here. If that falls out and you're anything like me, you'll probably be wondering for a while exactly where that went <laughs> and if you put it back in there without that in place you'll have a massive vacuum leak and no matter how nicely you've repaired your climate control system it just won't work properly so in order to get this apart you have to do a couple of things you have to start by taking this center brace off and I think that may be everything of course you want to be very careful not to lose any screws here magnetic screwdrivers are a godsend for this sort of thing and at that point see I've forgotten how I did this already <laughs> but at that point you're very close to oh, you gotta take more screws off you gotta take all these screws off so I'm going to do that and I'll be right back so I spent quite a bit of time thinking about a good, approachable way in which the solenoid module from the Ford EATC component could be tested, preferably with things that everybody has around their house or could get without spending an arm and a leg or, of course, a firstborn son, which is particularly concerning to me. And I did come up with something along those lines, but as I worked my way through it and actually put it into practice, I came to realize that I had more questions than I did answers. I started out with a source of vacuum. You saw this previously in the video when I was manually operating the car's various airflow governing doors. And then I decided to power the solenoids through my variable regulated power supply. This would allow me to bring them up quite gradually just to make sure that I wasn't putting too much juice through them and potentially burning the coils out. I realize that a lot of you out there in the viewing audience may not have one of these yet, may not feel that you need one, may not want one at all, and you're probably wondering how you could power this on your own. Well, I certainly wouldn't recommend that you used a car battery, even with a fused jumper lead, the potential for mayhem and even serious injury is just way too great. And if, even if you want that to happen, it's not a good idea to try and do it with a car battery because an explosion can be the result in quite short order. Even a little sealed lead acid brick battery can deliver an astonishing amount of electrical current for a very short period of time and it too could explode as the cells inside begin to outgas very quickly. But one way that would probably work, although you'd be tremendously unkind to it, if you don't have a variable regulated power supply of your own, would be to get a 9 volt battery. It doesn't even have to be a particularly fresh one and you could use that to connect 
the terminals of the solenoids to power. How do you actually connect the terminals of the solenoids to power? Well, that's where you have to get a little bit resourceful. I've done this before in the past. What works very well is a simple and cheap box of paper clips. I'll show you what I did right here. We'll actually zoom in on it so you can see. You can get kind of an idea. I just took a number of paper clips and all of those that ultimately electrically go to the same place for the purposes of my test at least. They're simply plugged into the right pins on the connector and then as you can see there's a clip lead holding them all in place. I'm not really sure. This is where the first question comes up. First of all I have no idea what the polarity of these solenoids is or if it actually matters which believe it or not sometimes for a DC powered circuit it doesn't matter. They've arranged it such that no matter which way polarity is coming in the thing still works. And I don't know what polarity these are driven with. A very common arrangement when something is driven by an integrated circuit or a transistor driver of some kind is to have the microcontroller or the driver chip or the driver transistor ground the component rather than supply power to it. So you have power coming in at all times and you're just waiting for the driver circuitry to ground it appropriately. I don't know what Ford actually did and while I could certainly take this module outside to the car and try powering it up and put a meter lead on this connector block right here, I would have some reservations about doing that because I would imagine the driver chip at least is probably not real well fault protected. I, I don't know if they put in any assurance against one of these solenoids perhaps shorting out and I don't really want to put that to a test. Though unfortunately, ultimately, I don't think that any of this is going to matter. What I can tell you about the wiring arrangement, and it makes a click in my stereo speakers if I had them turned up right now every time I connect and disconnect that, there must be a considerable amount of electrical energy expended when the, when the electric field inside those things collapses. And I think they've accounted for that in the design because you'll see there are a number of diodes here. There are at least four of them. There's a fifth one. I don't know what its purpose is. Maybe suppression for some other purpose. But these are probably suppression and protection diodes so that when the electrical field collapses inside the solenoid, that massive spike that's produced doesn't end up spiking the servo driver or worse than that the microcontroller and probably damaging both of them. It'd probably kill the microcontroller instantly and damage the servo driver after just a couple of shots. Ultimately though all of this is academic but the fact remains I really don't know how this thing is intended to be driven and I don't know if Ford's if Ford Motor Company service manuals would shed any light on the fact because I would imagine that Ford probably views this thing as a take it out and replace it kind of a part if it fails its diagnostic test in any way. And yes, there is a built-in diagnostic in these. I'll post information in the video description about how you can test your own and get fault codes back from it if you have any question about its state of functionality. So there's, there's just too many great unknowns here for me to continue testing this thing electrically. Unfortunately, along the way, I experienced a minor disaster while I was taking this thing apart. And since I've had it plugged in, you know, it was only only dissipating about 9 watts worth of current. But boy, oh boy, are those solenoid bodies. They're almost too hot to touch. I actually took one of these things apart and was going to show you everything that's inside there. I better be careful. That, that's pretty hot too. <laughs> but unfortunately, a spring went pinging off into lower Earth orbit, it landed on the floor somewhere, and as with everything else that lands on the floor, I'll probably never ever see it again, or it'll get swept up with some of the junk that's fallen on there. I mean, stuff falls off the workbench from time to time. It, it happens even if you're a pretty neat person, and I am not the world's most organized person. It's more like organized chaos, such as it might be. But what I was going to show you was that there's a little spring in there, I don't know exactly how this assembly functions. That's, that's another great unknown of this design. But you can at least see the new O-ring that the keykeeper and I installed. He took the modules apart and I actually did the work. And then there's this little black thing which has a, a rubber seal on one end that's large. And then on the other side it has a rubber seal that's smaller and has an indentation in it. Again, I'm not real sure how those are meant to go. We did have a couple of them fall out. It may not be terribly critical. I just I really don't have enough information. Are you beginning to notice a theme here? 
But the thing that I've noticed, regardless of whether this thing is powered or not, and here's why I need more information that I don't think I can ultimately get unless I do some more experiments, and I'm not really wanting to experiment on the one in the Key Keeper's car because it works, and I don't want to break it. But apparently there's another more sinister breakdown that these things can experience, and unfortunately I think this one probably has. I'll try and show you here. Let me see if I can find it myself first. And have a lengthy silence that we'll be editing out of the video. The plastic can crack in these. Oh yeah, I found it. I'll try to zoom in on it so you can see it as well. If it'll actually show up on the camera. I don't think it really shows up on the camera at all. But there's a crack in the plastic on this, and sure enough, when I've been trying to pull a vacuum on it, I've heard it hissing through the cracks. There also appears to be cracking damage on the other side. So I think I'm probably going to have to try and find a new one of these. The crack is down in here somewhere, and it's very minute. I'm not sure what kind of plastic this is, but it seems to be a rather brittle type. So I think I've reached the end of the line for this, unless anybody in the viewing audience knows something that I don't and has any suggestions. They, they would certainly be appreciated. But like I say, when I've been pulling a vacuum on this, I could hear it hissing out with or without the solenoids powered. I tried it a number of different ways, and I've come to the conclusion that there must be a crack in the plastic because I can see it. Reading around on some Ford Panther body car forums, I find that this is a much less common problem than O-ring failure, but there are certainly people who have reported it's happening to them, and I don't know if it's a matter of environmental factors, if it's, if it's climate, the constant cycling between hot and cold, because the environment within a car is extremely harsh due to the temperature swings. I just don't know what causes it. If it's going over bumps periodically, there's, there's a lot of I don't know here. But as I said, this was intended to be more of a troubleshooting and informational video to give you an idea exactly what this system is trying to do if you're faced with one that doesn't work, and my best efforts at, at trying to repair it. I know that if I had designed this, I would have designed it such that when the solenoids were unpowered, the pathway to the vacuum motors that they operate would be closed, and you'd be able to pull pressure on this thing. But like I say, I just don't know if that's what the designers did with it or not. So maybe there'll be some of you in the comments who've delved deeper into this repair than I have. I really have nothing to lose at this point, so I'm, I may try filling this up with glue, see if I can seal the cracks in it and get it to hold pressure. But I think it's probably time to either look for a replacement part, if that sub-assembly is available, or maybe even just go to a junkyard. So thank you as always for watching. I certainly do appreciate it. Maybe you've learned something. Maybe you can teach me something. Anything would be great. Anything to go on would certainly be awesome if any of you out there have any ideas. So I certainly look forward to hearing your useful and constructive comments.